Hello again, everybody. Um, as uh, as we're now all sort of accustomed to with the rhythm of our the days that we spend at different faith traditions, I'm really delighted to be joined by um, four uh, community leaders from the Euro Buddhist community. Uh, and it's extra fun today because they all know each other. These are all yeah. friends <laughs> through the New York Buddhist Council, which TK is currently the president of. But these are all folks who know each other, like each other, work together. So I think it'll be a lot of fun uh, to, to chat today. Um, I'm not going to introduce them all in detail. Their bios uh, are, as usual, in your handout. But I did just want to flag, as I usually do, um, some of the kind of range of the diversity of New York Buddhist life that we try to include um, in the panel. So um, we have both clergy uh, and lay leaders, um, three venerables and, and Sylvie, um, who's very active as a lay leader uh, in a range of different Buddhist communities. Um, we have uh, Theravada and Mahayana traditions, um, also uh, different sort of nationally distinct Buddhist traditions. Um, from Sri Lanka, from China, uh, from Japan, and actually two, two very different Japanese traditions, the early and the Zen. Um, and then also uh, Roshi Enkyo's somewhat different experience and background, and meaningfully different uh, experience and background as an American-born um, uh, Buddhist leader. Um, so uh, Sylvie San, um, Roshi Enkyo, um, uh, T, Reverend T.K. Nakagake and Bhante Kandanya. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I've asked them each to speak for only about 10 minutes, 10, 10 12 minutes. Because um, with all due respect, so I'm sure it will be wonderful presentations. The really best stuff always happens in the conversation afterwards. So we'll have about 10 minutes from each of our panelists and then a lot of time to just chat with them and engage together. Um, so Monte asked me to speak first. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so um, I don't know why. <laughs> and we are used to speaking endlessly, so it's a good thing that we have a ten minute. <laughs> which, which I will be slightly new. <laughs> good, good, please do that. Okay. I can take a few notes from your email to me what you'd like us to address. Kind of like ordinary life these days in Buddhist practice. And I am uh, obviously the only representative here of what we call convert Buddhism. So I come out of a Catholic tradition myself, and my community, my Sangha, uh, are primarily convert Buddhists. We have maybe 10% are ethnic Buddhists that came from another country, but the rest of the people uh, come from Jewish, Catholic, Protestant traditions. So they came to Zen, and I'm a Zen practitioner. Zen Buddhism from uh, usually a lot of youth uh, in another tradition. So we're quite quite different from what uh, Professor Gold uh, presented today because we are the tip of modernity in Buddhism. And Zen in particular um, has a reputation of being countercultural. Uh, it was introduced to this country by uh, D.T. Suzuki, who was uh, very, very much loved by John Cage, Noguchi, uh, many of the artists and writers in the uh, 40, late 40s and 50s and 60s, which then kind of went into the beatnik period of when I came of age. And so many of us were influenced by uh, Ginsburg, the Clure, a variety of poets and so forth, Gary Snyder. The ecology movement kind of uh, went into that too. So a lot of us who were very concerned about issues of ecology in our youth were uh, tempted to go uh, towards men. A lot of us found our birth religions not meeting the needs that we felt the revolution uh, required. And uh, we found ourselves uh, creating the Zen uh, in America or in the West. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues in Europe also who are hungry. My community is, uh, we, we have a loft space in Little Manhattan, in so I have 110 members, a lot of teachers, a lot of therapists, a lot of artists, musicians. But that's Manhattan, <laughs> downtown. 
Uh, I have colleagues in the Midwest, I have colleagues on the West Coast, all over, and their communities, the people are, are also often, are usually primarily hunger and primarily uh, in some kind of teaching or certain therapeutic kind of uh, world. This is the people that are attracted to hunger and Sam groups. How has it affected me? You know, I was a very political person and a very angry as a young woman. Um, you know, the uh, convention that's going on right now is a phone call. And what has happened to me is that you know, I've become much more compassionate <coughs> through the years. I've come to understand that these people that for, for whom I have a lot of dispute about their approach to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also human, and they are also people that I need to continually remind myself to have compassion for and to care about. At the same time, I can uh, hope uh, strategically and uh, compassionately disagree. So it has certainly had a huge effect on me. <coughs> I've always been very political, so it's not surprising that my community, which I'm the head, oh, by the way, I'm a <laughs> Sam in America has more women Zen teachers than men. So the gender wars are there. It's quite interesting. Uh, I mean, not wars because uh, half of my successors are men and half of my successors are women. So uh, we're also starting with this. We, uh, we still tend to be uh, kind of white. But we're doing our best to make those kinds of changes in my community. We're doing a lot of racial awareness work. My second Dharma successor is a, a black man in Philadelphia who has a nice big community there in Philadelphia, which is probably half black, half white. So we're doing our work in that in that world too. Um, we're very uh, socially active. We have a community of uh, practitioners, prisoners at Sing Sing Prison. Mm -hmm. And we go there every Sunday and uh, spend a half day with them. Some of the three representatives who are group go every Sunday and work with the prisoners. And when they get out, uh, we're there to support and we try and help them as we can. We're uh, pretty active, but we also have one uh, in a women's prison. Uh, we have a solitary letters group writes letters to people in solitary, you know, 40, 40 prisoners receive weekly letters from different practitioners. Um, we're very much against the death penalty. We've done a lot of us to stand up about that and particularly putting a lot of pressure, pressure on the governor. We stand outside this home <laughs> uh, petitioning uh, for pardons for elderly prisoners pardons for people who have been in prison for 30 and 40 years for drug offenses and so forth. I mean, it's just irresponsible in society to be doing that. So we have a very active uh, social action. Uh, we're also doing work on gender and disability this year. Uh, we're learning uh, sign language. And uh, to answer your question about religion, we, we do what we do in our community is we meet together, we chant, we sit in meditation. Uh, normally it's about an hour and a half of meditation. There's three half hour slots so that people can come and go because this is Manhattan. And, uh, <laughs> but we chant. We have uh, memorial services for people who've died, for family members who've died. Uh, I do baby blessings. I do funerals, I do marriages, just like uh, you would find in many of the communities. Uh, but about the, uh, the chanting, we do have these services, and one of my priests, who will soon be one of my Dharma successors, is a deaf man. So he starts to uh, sign uh, most of the basic chants that we do. And so if you come to the Village Zendo, uh, you'll see people uh, signing various aspects, liberation, and so forth. It's quite a wonderful uh, commitment we now have because of ocean uh, to uh, disability in all its other forms. We also have a, a priest that's now on the blind, and so our consciousness is being raised about what 
a community's responsibility is in that way. How am I doing? Uh, one minute? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, the one thing is, uh, you know, I loved uh, Professor Gold's uh, presentation of this theory. It, it's very important. It's important to realize that they, the, the three ways that he talked about have vastly different kind of focuses. And uh, Zen is part of the Mahayana wave that went to East Asia. And particularly in Zen, we're very influenced by Taoism and Confucianism so, and modernity, because this is where we are now. And so the focus very much is on everyday life. That's why it's possible to have a community and happen. We're open uh, seven days a week, three times a day, so that people can come here in the morning, noon time, and evenings. We do care about meditation very much. We're meditators, Zen people, Zen beings mind. We're, we're meditators, and so that's the primary thing that we do. Uh, and it's, it's very important to us to uh, to find that that practice because the belief is is that if we can find that intimacy in our daily life in our ordinary lives, just how we meet uh, the person that we have a transaction with at the store, or the person who's begging for uh, money on the street. If we can have an intimate relationship with those people, that is the reward. That is the merit. That we don't, we don't focus on another lifetime, or on receiving certain kinds of monetary or other kinds of, of, of gives back. It's really about moment to moment, daily life intimacy. So I'll put it in that. Thank you.
you know, because then they read like that when you go to you know, the airport or anything. This is a hello. Yes, it's a hello. And thank you. Goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I don't know if you know the words Amitabo. Amitabo, I guess. Amitabo, that's one thing. Uh, it was a, uh, that you can use, but at the same time, it was a, for me, it was a big surprise to come to the in this country and see Namami uh, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I thought it was that's the only the Japanese Buddhist section I'm mm -hmm. talking about Amida, but uh, basically all the Mahayana uh, Buddhism can be is uh, as something associated with Amida. So that's one of the uh, important Buddha in the Mahayana tradition. Although it was not introduced uh, but, uh, uh, but I think Zen is one too, but uh, there are a few other Buddhism. It's actually much larger <laughs> than computers and number ones. But it was not introduced well to the United States. Well, one, one reason is probably is the Amida system of Amida, and then the, uh, itself is very close to like, like a garden, human, garden people. But it, it's really different. But yet, uh, the way they translate is like Amida as if like a garden. So, so, so that was even like an original garden <coughs> from 100 years ago. They made the same with the words like they just changed. But the got, got part to Amida. So, so that was uh, we were we in Hawaii or even they start you know like over 100 years ago. Got is singing. They, they try to include some of the system that you have here. You know, like uh, we go to the church, you know, and we're singing, a lot of singing, so they decide to use all of those things too. So if I understand what you're saying is that uh, there are names for a lot of different Buddhas, and uh, when the influence of particularly Christianity, yeah. uh, you know, in Christianity we have God, just like one of But uh, there weren't just, there wasn't, there's not just one Buddha. Buddha is the one who picks up. So, uh, but when he transferred, uh, even still in the in the countries in Japan, Korea, and different places, uh, there was this influence of Christianity. And so it, it became more talking about when you come and ask God. And then, like I said, it's like hymns and so forth were made to sound, read, that sounded more like the Christian. But that's not, in fact, what your land represents. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that actually what happens in Japan nowadays, the Kyoran is an interpreter, like a god, but usually not, not like, uh, you know, Western, I mean, uh, like a christian god type of thing. But yet, some people, you know, uh, in Japan, I, I started realizing nowadays in Japan, you know, yeah, some of the scholars really talking about Amida as like similar to that idea of that. So, which is, Oh yeah, oh, unfortunately, well, it's just, there's a difference, a lot of big differences. The place itself is different, and uh, it looks the same, <laughs> maybe, but yet uh, nature itself is very different. <coughs> you might have to punch that. So anyhow, uh, so that's my background. And so I, the one that I wanted to maybe talk today, probably, first of all, is the, is the how do I live. And then for me, this is like a journey. <laughs> I mean, this life is, for me, it's a journey, meaning like I was going to find like, why do I have to come to the United States? And, you know, so the one reason was uh, really, uh, well, what, I'm half converted and half temple fashion. <laughs> so meaning like uh, I was, you know, my grandfather has a temple, so my uncle is a, really is a temple family. But at the same time, I only go to the temple and, uh, what is it? summertime and then the winter, the new year. So that's the only time. Because my uh, father is the second one and he was not obeying anything. So that's why I was raised in a kind of a regular one. So, so then the one thing when I, you know, people ask, I mean, when you go to school, they ask the question, what do you want to become? I don't have anything I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have one thing I don't want it to be. That was don't want to be a Buddhist <laughs> 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 so, so that's, you know, that's, so which means I don't have a good experience for me. <laughs> so even I 
have hungry, you have to go to the shrine first and then and, you know, sit and then do the chanting and meditation. And then after that, I thought we can go to eat. The, I have to listen to the Dharma talk or a sermon. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this can be a kind of painful experience. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, so what so happened? I don't, I don't know how much I have time, but I don't know how much time. Yeah. But, but one, one point, uh, of course, um, that changed my mind was when I went to the university. I wasn't planning to go to the Buddhist university, actually. But my uncle is a professor at the university, you know, this university in Kyoto. And uh, so, you know, if you have an uncle who is a professor at a certain university, you have to apply also. <laughs> you can apply other places too, of course. But then, the, if you pass, and then after that, if you pass that particular university, you like, I'm hoping you need to go. Mm. And then actually my parents said, if you're going to this university, who will pay for you? <laughs> so as a student, first student, <laughs> I decided to go to the university. Mm. Uh, and uh, then at that time, I started learning Buddhism. Then that particular Buddhism is a really refreshing Buddhism. It's not like a, a Buddhism that I understand. Buddhism in Japan, for me at least, was a you know, was a painful experience. <laughs> and at the same time, very uh, fearful place because they have a graveyard in the back. You feel like a ghost is coming all over it. <laughs> so, and then a lot of funeral going on, a lot of you know, the ceremonial things. So not as much of the uh, basic you know, thoughts and uh, you know, philosophy or even practice. So, so that's why that I started, uh, you know, yeah, uh, kind of making it easy. Uh, at the same time, I came to the United States when I was high school students uh, at the 1978. I don't know, you're not the age of Star Wars. <laughs> but I'm talking about first Star Wars. So the first time I came to Los Angeles. So at that time, the three things are very famous. Hotel California, or I mean, <laughs> Hotel California. And then the Farah Fawcett measures. <laughs> Yeah, I got a t-shirt that the third one is the Star Wars world. So anyway, that was a year that I first came. But actually, that, for me, that was a very interesting experience. Because in you know, Japan, it's like everything is a group-oriented means we have to worry about everything for my or the real Davis friends. You know, it's like a, <laughs> what is it, net, you know, I'm in the middle of the net of all those things, so we can't move much. But when I first came, I even came to the United States, that's open everywhere. I mean, sky is big too, you know, Japanese, <laughs> you know, small country, you know. so very crowded. But so, so those things totally kind of changed the way. And so, so I kind of uh, enjoyed that particular experience, especially Grand Canyons and so forth, you know, vast, vastness. And so, so that's where I decided to come to uh, the United States, maybe and see what I can do. I just have a, a couple minutes, but could I ask you to say a little bit about your know, work now? Like, what is kind of? I just say anything when I work. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's for the Yeah, that's okay. Right. Um, but could you say a little bit about the, the Buddhist Council yeah. or other yeah, other yeah, that's other right. <laughs> Awesome. But at the same time, no, this is very important for me to know that. Uh, so I serve at the temple for 25 years, but now I don't have a temple meeting. I have a freelance. <laughs> so I don't talk about community, I don't carry the community, but at the same time, if I don't carry anything, so it means I carry everything, so which is a very nice, deep thing. So the Buddhist council for me is now is like, since I don't belong to anybody, so which makes it easier for me to run the Buddhist council also, because I don't have to pay for any particular you know, organization or anything, but at the same time, uh, so I can bring all people together. And so right now, I'm, I'm, so I'm, for me, the three things that I'm focusing is actually the, about the, the way of bringing the peace I mean, in my way. Because that's, uh, for, for me, the, the Buddhism idea of Buddha is always you know, part of peace. But, but uh, of course, I have to explain all this, what it means by peace and so forth. But <coughs> the other thing is the focusing on that dialogue, uh, so among the Buddhists. Because we don't have, we have all Buddhists in Japan, but each one is a sectarian. 
I don't think so. Not, not there's a one voice. What is it? Because we really stand for. So we don't have voice in that. So we wanted to have some good sports together. Like, you know, we just talk about fake punks these days, but even that is a kind of good sports we wanted to bring. So then the things that I wanted to do to a good sports bring. The third one, uh, I'll say. You want to say the third one really quick? Well, I actually feel like mission of the bringing the meaning of the swastika back. Ah. But mm -hmm. swastika is a symbol of the symbol or the Eastern symbol. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but that's a third one. Well, it might be interesting maybe to come back to later as a dilemma of the teaching system. Right, right. Can, can I just interrupt and say that uh, TK has been the person that has brought all the Buddhists, uh, different schools together. He's a, he's a wonderful advocate for Buddhism in general, and he was the one that, that made sure that we were able to begin to ask for like a Buddhist holiday, because there's a Jewish holiday, an Islamic holiday, how about a Buddhist holiday, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And right now in New York, we're faced with a very difficult situation where there are, there are some people who are dressing up as monks and asking for money, and they're not monks. Uh, and uh, their thugs, and uh, he and, and TK has has spoken out on this and has brought the attention to, to the uh, authorities and also on television. So he's just a wonderful advocate for all of us, and it's wonderful for us to see all the different forms of Buddhism being represented. Uh, I, I would also I mean, just to throw in my two cents on this. Uh, it's something. I mean, one of the things that we really stress throughout this program is understanding the diversity within every religious tradition, which is just as deep and complicated as the diversity among traditions. But you know, in a lot of faith communities in New York, there's all this extraordinary diversity, but the different groups are not really in conversation, or sometimes they're very suspicious of each other and even hostile. And then when I go to like Buddhist Council of New York events, it's just extraordinary to see like practically every Buddhist community coming together for holidays, um, and, and I know all four of you have been really instrumental in that, the TK is the president at the moment, so I think it's great. No, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Back to Al Borjo from Taiwan. And I was in Taiwan. I didn't 
maybe nobody can give me the answer, really. It's not popular, especially Taiwan was the colony of the Japanese for many years. So we started to find the world to, 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 to translate Diamond uh, Sutra, and the author, two of the books, authors say that, okay, if you are luckily in New York, I take the retreat, uh, they go to the retreat, uh, attending the retreat with uh, this uh, amazing teacher, <coughs> Master Shen Ye, uh, then we Chinese say Chen, Chen, uh, Chen Master. So, of course, when I come to here, I open up the newspaper where I was a friend and waiting to get birth of my children living in Florida, still in the 70s. <coughs> uh, open up the Chinese newspaper, there's a big advertisement. And he's giving the presentation of, uh, uh, I think it's that Dan Shu Chua's uh, in that life. So mm. I went there, right there, he hit me because uh, he's saying plan Chinese. Yes. There's no difficult term. He just <coughs> said that, okay, in Dan Shu Chua, there's a full form and no form. From full form of the uh, phenomenon, uh, world, the world we live in, and then we see it as a no form. So I don't understand. That's what I recite it every time I'm on the plan. That's my everyday work, my daily work. I check one time, so then I can go to work. Uh, I don't understand to yourself yeah, because uh, try to understand and you know try to memorize. There's a full form. Uh, form of uh, you, form of me, form of a sexual being, form of life. And what it means? Then there's a no form, no four form. So in his uh, presentation, his speech, he go right into it and say, uh, there's a no form, we practice the no form, then your mind arrives. So that's how we practice. And he explained, the other day, one of my students come to see me. I haven't seen him for a long time. So I asked him, what's up? What's cooking? I don't know. What's so, <laughs> <laughs> up? So uh, my student told me, I'm sorry, Sufu. I have been very busy with uh, my home, so I cannot come here. My, uh, my wife is uh, always nagging, complaining. Uh, I have to do so many chores, so I can't come. So my master, the teacher, Master Sayyid, replied, Oh well, you have to practice it. Don't I tell you the full forms when your wife complains to you, there's no new form. And you, when he complains, you don't see the world. You don't put yourself for healing and put it inside of you. There's a no new form. Mm -hmm. And there's a no everybody's form. When people, you do whatever to help them. There's a, just come from your heart. So that was in <laughs> Suddenly I know, well, so simple, but yet they put it on the ancient world, so difficult to understand. That's all that after then I followed him back to his uh, temple, and from the time whenever he get a uh, lecture in uh, Sikong, Brothers, I found it. I will go to work around my own business, but I will and I just try to no Google, just look for the address and call him and try to get there and come back. So two things very important in my life is uh, meditation and volunteer. Because uh, I was uh, belong to the lay people. I belong to the supporting group. So my job in my thinking, okay, I have to help. How to help? The only thing I know is how to make money and how to donate. <laughs> so I asked, I asked uh, the director for your class, uh, we all know, the earliest uh, consults. Uh, he was uh, my master's disciple. He is the only one that had there. So I said, so what can I help you say? 
Well, you cannot, you cannot really do anything, but we do help. We do need help from uh, rice and oil. That time nobody did money, you say. We need rice and oil. As long as we have rice, we can cook for people, and oil to stay to cook for meal. So I said, how much do you want for a month? He said, well, do what I do. Okay, so start there. I generate some of my friends, every month, and my friends who are housewives, and this is all. I said, hey, can you give me $20? Back to that, that time, like almost 30 minutes, so people only got $1 to, to the home they bus. So I said, can you save some money from your uh, monthly allowance, uh, household in money? So I started to do that. That's my first uh, engagement. And then my master is not happy. I mean, not be happy, you say. And I say, okay, what can I do? He say, can I come to cook? You know, Sunday service. I want to cook. Uh, uh, can I donate a cent to the monthly rising? Or can I put up the money? He said, no, no matter. But you have to come to here and cook for yourself. But I don't cook. He said, you learn. <laughs> <laughs> cook uh, assistant. And you have to go to the cheapest uh, uh, <coughs> Elmhurst. There's a Indian market, and some market are the cheapest. Mm -hmm. You can only go there to buy the grocery and bring the veggie bag and cook. Mm -hmm. So I'll start from there. I cook for the retreat, uh, I fundraising. I do the first fundraising to be our retreat center. Even right now, okay. Ma now, yeah, cooking. And then he started to say, you have to learn. Painful, really painful. We don't have uh, every ceremony, every conference. We don't have a chair. That's all we could share. Before it started, you had to sit for 30 minutes. My knees are painful. <laughs> <laughs> but you learn through it. So, well, two important thing is the meditation for me and do volunteer work. Not really on the money. Because the money is last issue to donate your time, to donate your energy, to donate your specialist uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you on that, uh, I was uh, with him like, uh, 20 years. I was the more full member of the Chan Meditation Center. I was the deputy director when he first formed that time from one, because I think we expanded to the uh, different chapter, 20 something chapter around North America. Uh, I helped to start it. I was the deputy director for Dhammaja Mountain uh, Buddhist Association. And then to 2005, when Master is uh, health condition become, decided to go back to Taiwan. And big Dhammaja Mountain uh, Education Center, War Education Center was part uh, already complete, complete the building for making my bonus and 50 years. So I followed him back to uh, Taiwan. That time my son just uh, entered NYU. The first year, uh, freshman, my daughter already in college. So I just uh, I remember it in September after the uh, other days. The next day, I went to school. I take the plan. Right to Taiwan. Uh, I was thinking it's about my time to sharpen my uh, the knowledge and end the sutta start because we have an uh, uh, institute, Buddhism institute, uh, <coughs> not, it's an institute funding there. I want to go there to start because some of my uh, volunteer friends in Taiwan who joined there and they did in the mountain thing. They started to do the volunteer. And one thing in Dumbledore Mountain in New York, we don't have none of one paid stuff. Everybody volunteered. In my early, when I was 40 years old, I already retired. I was my husband's family. So I've been full times working in the Dumbledore Mountains that own person from the Czech Center. And I said, uh, <laughs> we just have a couple of minutes, but I wondered if you could say something also about what is what we believe. Because yes. I know that people, there was a question came up after John's presentation about 
um, engage Buddhism okay. and social justice issues in other groups? Uh, yeah, 2009, my master, he passed away. And uh, while I was in the mountain on 2006, I met Bernard Bittu uh, we received him as uh, giving uh, lectures in the institute. He's supposed to give three things. Eventually, he can only give like a couple hours because he's health package. <coughs> so from there, I was involved by him. And when I, my master passed away, 2009, I came back to uh, New York. I went to pay uh, respect to my master's teacher, uh, who. Uh, stay in, uh, who has his own monastery, holy monastery, guess who was the, out there at that time? It was the uh, Renovold, Big Bob, who was uh, out there. He saw me the first time. He said, Sylvia, I need your help. I wasn't, you know, it was a little bit resistant. I said, finally, I don't need to do the fundraising. I don't want people seeing me always uh, look at me and say, hey, I owe you, how much I owe you this month? <laughs> Uh, okay, so eventually I got the blessing from our headman in Amjong Mountain. He said, go ahead. So go ahead and help them. So I went, started there. Uh, I was a board member and also a fundraising, fundraising chair for uh, the school board And it was a uh, privilege because, uh, again, two best, uh, I mean, this. Uh, of this uh, vulnerable one, they are amazing, but there's uh, so many amazing teachers, with or then or without or then. Uh, so I have a uh, really blessing. So since then, our goal is uh, mission and work is to find the global hunger and malnutrition. Uh, there's uh, so many issues around the world have the poverty. Why can I have food? So then, uh, as you may know, Big Bodhi is very uh, strong, urge everyone when you're sitting on the meditation, sending the loving kindness matter around the world. I mean, generate your compassion. It's time you should get up to get the work. Take the work, take the action. As Buddhists always say that faith, vows, and action practice. So, this is the uh, three things we always uh, you know, continue to uh, review it, revisit it. So, uh, since then, my main job is uh, to be, uh, say it a little bit like a, like a dream, but one day, hopefully, everybody can live with uh, freedom from suffering, freedom from uh, harming itself.
very powerful, three, four, nine, four, six. Dana, generosity, sila, morality, and bhavana, which is meditation. These are very important factors in those cultures. Generosity, so therefore, mostly, if you notice that, you see, Buddhist countries, people very much giving, they are always <laughs> generously, they are supporting. Why? I don't know about Sila. <coughs> Sila means, uh, in, let me just, you know, introduce a little bit more. Many of the teaching part of the Buddha, he talks about five precepts and uh, four qualities, four sublime state of living. Mitta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, uh, mudita, altruistic joy, and equanimity, which is called uh, upekka. So in many sutras, he emphasized, live with these five principles and cultivating this noble way of life. That's called four sublime way of living. Metta, karuna, mudita, those are Pali words. Loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity. The economy is to balance yourself. Ups and downs. Life is with all its ups and downs. So these things they remember. So our lives goes shaping these principles. And uh, so from Buddhist countries, I don't know how much virtue sila they can practice. They were always, you know, close hearted. <coughs> People may fail to, to cover up. I believe most they like to do this. At least they can do something for to these uh, teachings to exist, supporting the practitioners. Right? That's that's how I they I think many of them they try to do that. At least I can do this. And as a lay follower like uh, uh, Silvi, Silvi said as a uh, again the Sangha always there are fourfold. We could be kuni upasika upasika monks, nuns, upasika lay male and lay female. So these are the communities that are connected together, supporting each other. They try to keep continuing this teaching practice. And uh, so, uh, bhavana, meditation, is hard, difficult, but they must do. This is where the wisdom arises. Wisdom can gain from this clarity. So that's, you know, of course, you can see that here, mindfulness, the Zen, all these things are same. I know that traditions have changed, they have developed, but originally meditation means, you know, they start from mindfulness meditation, come to Jhana state, that Jhana word went to China, Chan, it went to Japan, became Zen, this is how it is, but that's, those are traditions there, beautiful traditions, enriched by those, and also we have to remember, wherever Buddhism went, it enriched the culture which was existing in the country. So those are the main differences. Among us, when we go to country to country, you may see Buddhists, but even sometimes if I am ignorant Buddhist, I may notice they are as Buddhists. Why? Culturally different. So Dharma is the same. Dharma part is the same, but most what we notice is cultural parts. So in my life, so going with, now I'm just happy to talk, looking at the time. <laughs> I. How I shape my life. I'm from a traditional Buddhist family. I always used to go to temple with my grandmother. Of course, we are care as from childhood, we always learn to care for our elders. So in my life I see that mostly so much influence in that because we were so much interested in doing meritorious deeds. So we learn as a child that taking care of, helping, supporting elderly people or anybody is a high meritorious practice. So I remember every morning, uh, no, every full moon day mornings, full moon day mornings, I, my grandmother goes to temple, so I carry her back with her when we go to retreat. Retreat means from one, uh, this morning, six o'clock to the next morning, six o'clock, they stay in the temple. You know, practicing, offering, chanting, <coughs> practicing meditation, this is this how that lifestyle goes. Other than that, I, I, as a child, I enjoy. I also follow the same path, which I stay in the temple all night, all day. But why I did go? 
I think other than my school, that's where I meet my friends. So I enjoy having my meeting companions. And also, uh, in the afternoons, after morning sessions, or uh, after lunch time, we go around all you know, our friends' houses, having a bag in hand to collect flowers. You know, we don't buy flowers like here. We collect, picking up flowers from the trees. Every home has flower trees. Why? When I remember when I was, you know, uh, planting a flower tree, we planted it off at the Buddha, not for not anything else. So that's how, you know, devotionally, you know, you know uh, community people work. So we, from each house we go and collect. By evening, we have offering of flowers. So it's beautiful, like if they are like this place. So from him to myself, and we pass the flower, you know, uh, the trays among us, reciting in Pali chanting. So we send and we go for the Buddha. Even though Buddha did not ask us to do that. That's how we show our devotion, our respect to Buddha. So that I enjoy. And after that, I never thought of becoming a monk. I never had a desire. But somehow one day I was asked from my class teacher. Those days my lady name was Sunny. Sunny, do you like to become a monk? I couldn't answer him. <laughs> and uh, I, it took me about three days to make up my mind. So my, I couldn't answer my teacher, and my teacher spoke to my father, my father asked me again. And I said, hmm. Then later on I said, OK, if I can go to school, I don't mind going. <laughs> so that was my answer. <laughs> so I, I thought, so after that my father gave me so long, about long discourse of, you know, advices. So he discouraged me in a way, but, but I strengthened it by his advice. So he said, he, at last what he said was, if you, I don't want you to go back and forth. This is not a nice way of living. So if you make it right, you have to make it, it's a hard life. He said, Mark's life is hard life, it's difficult. You don't have your father and mother behind you. So you have to rely on yourself. So, mm, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I became a man. <laughs> Just a couple of minutes left, I wonder, could you say a little bit about the Sri Lanka? Yes, I will. <laughs> There are more to say about you. There's always more to say. So I came um, in 1981. I won a scholarship to go to Japan, and from there I came here in 1981. And then, first round of uh, left my tour as like inspection. <laughs> my, set, my teacher asked me to go to New York and go because I, we had our center there. Then I went back, and again I came back in 1985. I never thought of coming here. I thought, because I had plenty of work to do in Sri Lanka, but somehow it happened to be here. Then again, I was in, in, in New York, uh, Bihar, for about 15 years. After that, while I was living there, I saw that many people are not going to temple because of distance, because of their own lifestyles, because they have to struggle with their new immigrants have their life you know, issues. So I thought I felt very bad about it because normally as a child they have, I, I believe personally, they have to have spiritual way of living, as I live. <laughs> so I saw that it's missing in those lives. So then what I did was being there in, in New York, I, I saw many Sri Lankan Buddhists are living on Staten Island. So what I did was, there was a family, one family always go to temple, every month they go. So with that connection, I said, um, let's do something for these children. You know, you people are working, you are ignoring, you know, you know, ignoring children. They are just babysitters on the TVs, and parents are working. This is not very healthy condition. So I said, I, we want to do something. So what we did was we had a bi-weekly uh, classes I began to moving, new moving trucks. One day in Henry's house, one day in your house, like twice we move. So gathering place each day. So that way I continued to uh, move around and teaching children. I didn't, didn't teach anything deep, but just being with them and teach, telling them stories. 
So they sort of, you know, sort of they liked it. So then after that, when I came to the Vihara, many children start coming because the problem was language barrier. They were monks, they didn't speak the language. So after I came, I, I was not happy with it. So, so I encouraged people to bring, you know, children. And I was, I was sitting with them and playing with them, telling them stories. They kind of like the place that they start coming back to the temple. <laughs> so then I start moving around and moving. You know, I told them once, if somebody gives me a car, I will change the system. <laughs> the change the system is, instead of waiting here, I will go around and find the, you know, places where you people are, then I can contribute myself. I thought that's my contribution to the community and for the children. So then I started moving around. Uh, Later in 19, when I finished my, at the meantime I was going to school too. Just for my benefit, I thought I should be, why should I waste my time? I should benefit from this staying here. So I did my social work studies. And when I finished in 1996, then I told people in Staten Island, if you people are ready, you can organize something, I will give my time. So I speak to the you know, uh, senior man and get together. Don't tell him that I said, I told him. But it's not something coming from me. So, <laughs> but he so you know, that it should be coming from the people. You know, it's need of it. If you see that it's need, you do it. Otherwise, I'll have my program. I'll do that later on. So people were happy about hearing that. Then they came to the you know, senior man. And after that, then he came to talk to me again. Then we discussed and okay. Then we started this. I mean, the temple in on Staten Island. So people are happy. And now uh, I started many programs for children, like summer camps. Normally in our temples, we don't have summer camps, things like that. So retreat for children, youth uh, programs in time to time. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy about doing those things. And in addition, there's so many things in the personal, they are community uh, issues. Personally, they have problems. Some people do, does not have the job, losing jobs, and things like that. So we have to organize the community and support. So these are the work that I do, and I do it here, and I do wherever it can. And some people sometimes from distance they, you know, get advice. I have become consulting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so spiritual way of you know whatever the way that we can support them, we do keep supporting. So of course. In our personal life, uh, how, in other words, those are all community work. But spiritually, how is it going to be helpful for us? So we, every day we do chant and meditate, of course, as Professor mentioned. Uh, those uh, teachings, are uh, we have to make a part of our life, day to day life, and the purpose of living is not just to live here, but enhance our spirituality and find the liberation as we perform. So that effort, we personally, that's a personal. Everybody, of course, as a monk, they should do it, otherwise you are wasting your time. Because human life, in according to the teachings, human life is so rare. So therefore, it's always encouraged benefit from what you have. This is the life as a human being and apply these teachings and enhance your spirituality because it's a long sojourn of samsara as we said. Samsara is so long, so Buddha said that monks, you and I have been here in the cycle of life and an uncountable, unmeasurable time. So therefore, due to our ignorance, due to, since we did not know the true nature of it, so therefore, diligently practice and find your liberation. You are the master of the lesson. Thank you. Okay, we have at least a half an hour, maybe a few minutes more. Just go ahead and write open. That's the money. Um, I was thinking that like, when we, for example, when we examine like the certain doctors in like Christianity, um, we saw how it affected like the government or like politics and stuff like that. Can you speak, you started to speak a little bit about the community how uh, Buddhism was like a vehicle to enhance the community. Could you 
speak a little bit more how uh, Buddhism and whatever uh, locations are, those different locations are most important. Uh, how does that how it feels political, maybe economic, and definitely the aspect of culture mm-hmm. and the environment? In reality, I just share a word. Uh, in reality, I don't get involved in politics-wise, but in our community, I know that they struggle to survive their lives. So depending on you know, their personal skills, other than that, I don't think that, you know... Well, okay, I know this is, this is a huge, complicated I issue know. that you're not um, directly involved in here, but in Sri Lanka, Buddhism is very, I don't know the whole story, but it's very closely tied to state government, and there's been some history of conflict between Buddhist and Hindu communities. Is that something that Those touched not you when you were a kid? Or? No. Uh, the, you know, Buddhism, yeah, of course, Buddhism used to be a state religion you know, in a, from our history. You know, that's a state religion. So, from, you know, not, you know, current uh, political situations. Even the royal system is there, so all the kings were taken care of. Okay. Whoever uh, taken care of church relic or the temple, you know, that's, they are the one who is the uh, power in, you know, state of power. Um, so, and also monks were the advisors for at the time. They always seek monks at the time. Because that's, uh, monks were the educated people, early, early part of the time. They are the community center, they are the community leader, they were teaching. And recent years, of course, yes. And monks didn't uh, involved in the fighting, but government they did. And of course, pressure comes from you know, when they're doing something government is not doing right, they pressure us in that into space. If you know monks are not speaking, so coming to me and ask, why are you keeping fight? You monks, suppose you are always carrying the torch, so uh, you are not doing it, so always get blamed. Uh, Hindu, I think that the politicians made this, you know, to gain the votes. What they were selling, they were selling the uh, false uh, picture to the people. And also language value was one of those things, you know, too. Otherwise, you know, they, whatever in our country, we had a problem with North and South. Uh, Northern side and Southern side, people are suffering the same but none of those th- people knew each other about that. So in the in the middle, where the, you know ad- administration were, they are in the you know luxurious lifestyle. They were not doing anything. So in that sense, there was some involvement because they were Buddhist. Not because of Buddhist, they were you know having to fight this uh, wrong image, wrong uh, presentations of politicians. I think corrupted politics, politi- 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 we... Yeah. I, I, think, but I think it's important for teachers to remember, though, that you know, that kind of, um, you know, politicians co-opting a religious tradition, religious identity as a, as a form of, you know, political life and sometimes violence, you know, that happens in Buddhism, too. Because Buddhism is, is, is often presented as like, the, the one and only peaceful religion in the world. And all the other religions are in conflict, but isn't it great you know, that Buddhism is purely a uh, peaceful tradition? And of course it emphasizes nonviolence and, and creating peace, but there are ways that Buddhism has been used for violence as well. Like every other I thing. see it as, not as Buddhism, but people who work like this, yes. who work with yes. 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 I think that's nothing to do with Buddhism. Yes. Buddhism Very never good. told Very good. to go and fight. Of course. Yes. Um, well, I guess um, for me, uh, this is all the, in terms of involvement is uh, always all depends. <laughs> but because it seems, seems like uh, sometimes uh, this principle, I, I like uh, right now in Japan, I was thinking <laughs> it was probably the situation like uh, you know obvious. But, but at the same time, it's the, uh, the sound of value that was I mean, like a value before, like, you know, actually war, you are talking about war parts too, you know, the, the Japanese institution did not carry the nuclear weapons and all those things. And also military, 
education shouldn't be, but that's really based upon some of the Buddhist principle, and uh, which was like like the first principle. I mean, you know, the institution if you have was created like six four six four four, which is sixteen hundred years ago. Uh, I mean, fourteen hundred years ago. Sorry. Uh, but at that time, also there's a politics and Buddhism sort of together, <laughs> meaning like in order to bring the, this country of Japan, then what do you want it to be a country, make it a peace with the value, and no ahimsa, uh, sort of no violence is the way, and then the uh, communication, the uh, dialogue is a very, very important. That's the first chapter of the 17 articles. And the second one, then how you achieve it, then you need to have the central things, which is with the Dharma Sangha, which is a teaching of the Buddhist basically, to respect the teacher and then understanding the truth, and also respect each other. So those, those are one of the second chapters of school. And then so it just continues. So in a way, from the beginning, for Buddhism in Japan, the Buddhism and uh, politics are sort of kind of combined together. Because, because any of the politics need a kind of a body, core body, then where those core bodies should be coming. And so that was the choice. And then so the God, I mean, in my opinion, war is associated with the politics, not necessarily religion. And the, the, because religion is great for many ways, they got you. But then the, for me, nowadays, what I'm thinking is always, Politician is a big problem for <laughs> the <laughs> country. I would just like to say, I'd like to say, I'm bursting with uh, yeah. to say something. <laughs> there is no, there's no religion that hasn't been co-opted by, I mean, there, it's always, it's because we have been something we believe. I mean, look at the, look at the uh, Crusades. I mean, look at what's going on in Israel. Look at, I mean, you can't go anywhere and not see how What's going on in Cleveland right now is, you know, a co-opting of people's sincere faith, belief, and philosophies. And I, I just think it's naive to think that that isn't so. I just have to say that. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my, my community, which is an American sort of Zen, uh, we have gone back to the Japanese and said, you have to apologize for oh. what happened. Uh, you have to apologize for these things. And our, the, the Soto School is like the bad thing. It's powerful and lots of money. And we're like outcasts, Americans and Westerners. Uh, but they have apologized as a result of our pressure on them over the last 25 years. Apologized for the, the things that happened in Nanjing and China and so forth. So it's important for religious clergy to stand up and my view. In, in my tradition, which is my Mayana tradition, we're allowed to do that, uh, to stand up and, and look at the ethical issues involved. Especially this part is very important for me. So I, I, that's why I want to talk about a little bit in terms of peace, where the Buddhism stands. Yes. The, the battle is not the who is winning or who is um, apologize for the lives, for all of the lives. You know, right. It used to be when the, the people fight, they kill each other. But then the, 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 normally they respect, at least they, they, they know who they are. So but that's you what, say that but, every uh, spiritual uh, tradition uh, says non-harming, non, non no, no, but then at the same time, the enemies and then the friends are alike. That, that's actually, for me, is very important. They're one. They're not two. Okay, just we could um, we could go down the rabbit hole of religion We're going politics down the rabbit hole right now. But let's uh, other questions to <laughs> other other aspects of Buddhist life. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. But actually, I wanted to say something because of the just not things too because. Uh, President Obama visited Hiroshima like uh, May 27 uh, uh, this year. For the first time, this is, I don't know, for you, it's one visit, but then for the Japanese people, that was a historical event, the history of Hiroshima and so forth. But at the same time, you know, that, the part of the apology was kind of included, and was not included, but at the same time, for, for us, for Japanese people, this is much, much great to just even show the respect to the people who died. And then, uh, so that's, that should be done for you. Because the life, you know, because traditionally we become friends or uh, enemies, but yet, you know, uh, part of the, the distribution also, all sentient beings, 
these lives should be respected. So from that aspect, you know, uh, for the, any kind of wars and so forth, you know, after you finish that list, you sort of respect, you know, and, uh, I mean, taking a life, other's life, but then sometimes they feel like, oh, we have to be mean, and that's it. But there used to be, you know, after, after you know, if an enemy, I mean, opponent had killed them, they're supposed to also show the respect to their enemies and uh, to, you know, because they cannot take care of their bodies later, so the ones who want to take care of them, and then sort of to show the shared and more shared goes talked before, you know, that one of the things that you said Buddhism has taught you is a deep compassion for the people that you disagree with most, which is so important, honestly, in these days. Yeah, Other I'm questions? Yes, I'm yeah. very shy. Uh, I believe every religion, look at it, 80% of the people are belong around the world, are belong to one religion, one faith that they believe. Uh, so it plays so crucial role around the world and this country. In China, from the history of dynasty, Ming dynasty, all corrupted, have a corrupted uh, uh, person because uh, the leader of the country tend to want to get a blessing or consultant from the leader of religion. This is the around the world over there because the religion holds the people. Uh, that's one thing that happened, same thing uh, in uh, my master's teaching. He asked us uh, among our Sangha, there's uh, four things we shouldn't, we should be very careful as a Sangha. First, do not engage of uh, means conduct, uh, sexual relationship among our Sangha. Second, no money exchange, no solicitate my business or this and that. No politics. You keep encourage everybody go walk, but keep it for yourself because it's the right thing as a citizen. But to keep a harmony uh, society, we have to respect the majority. So this is very individual. We we'll carry that. And as I was in the mountain, there's a different as you may know. Previously, always TV here fighting in Taiwan is uh, uh, the two party. Fighting always, uh, even the action. Uh, he always uh, been, when I was there, he always uh, secretly, the mountain was uh, shut down and say, okay, this is the president come to visit him. Because different parties come, but he never shared. But this is how the situation is. I think it's really individual. And also individuals of uh, leader of the base, the base. I remember who makes the point about because you are the educated, learned sections of your community that people want you to help them understand the political situations and how do you do that without taking sides or I mean, is that a role that your your people want? It's always a common that's my thing so I don't have to show this but as we already said out the we don't discuss the, the thing that us inside our sangha. You can do whatever you want outside. I keep it because this is a free for everyone. Can I use that tool to influence others? I think the when they decide they tend not to make much of stats actually. Because uh, each one can take a stand, but uh, as an organization, they normally not stand that much. Inter unless, unless they really is against the, you know, the, the dispute. But so in a way, the uh, people share. And then uh, it's, it's important to understand all the different aspects of it, uh, but not necessarily you know, sort of attached to it. Probably one is understand being others or opponent, why they do the way that they do is probably more important than the what why I'm doing. Because I'm doing I know a problem <laughs> most of the time. But then the other thing <coughs> sometimes we don't understand then how can you solve the problems anyway. So probably if there's an issue out there the problem for me is understanding others is probably much more important. And so that you know where what you should do. 
uh, organization, there's a different on an organizational level. You might have a group of, uh, of clergy that decide to make a statement, you know, and often that you know, takes forever because we have to send it back and forth and how we feel. We made a st statement on Black Lives Matter, for example, we made a statement on what happened to Baton Rouge. We, we, we do that kind of thing. Organizationally, I'm talking about in, in America, you know, all the same teachers. When you say we, you mean the that no, 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 I'm just saying, in America, uh, all the Zen teachers. But on a local level, uh, I will explore with the people the ramifications of what's, what's happening. Uh, but I'm not going to tell people how to vote or uh, to do that kind of thing, but explore from a spiritual point of view what, what's the implication here of uh, this, these decisions about uh, Medicare, these, these decisions about uh, whatever, whatever's going on, police violence and so forth. We'll talk about it from a spiritual point of view, but not so I, I as a leader in the community, tell somebody what to think. I wouldn't do that, but I would open it up, you know, and just the issues that TK uh, mentioned, like this now. So I'm sorry, I, I missed how to refer to you, uh, Roshi. Roshi is an old teacher, and I'm old. Roshi means teacher, essentially, or old she teacher. She is teacher. Uh, <laughs> Monte <laughs> means uh, venerable, venerable, essentially. TK, you have my reverend. I don't use my title. Reverend. You don't, okay. well, yeah. But you, you, if, you, if you had a title, it's I reverend. Like the title. Well, you don't like the title. <laughs> 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 But often, often in, in speaking with Buddhist clergy people, not always, but often we'll just, the same way that you might say to a Christian minister, like, you know, hey, reverend, and reverend would be it. When I say, you know, hello, Bonte, it's like, hello, venerable, and uh, in the same, very much the same way that you'd say, hello, reverend, to a Christian. Mm -hmm. anyway. uh, so I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, how other people have questions of authenticity, and, and if, if so, if you, if you have um, experienced that, um, how do you confront that with you? What kind of conversations happen surrounding that? You know, uh, the, the Zen line that I belong to is very rigorous. Uh, I wouldn't give transmission to anybody who had not studied in 20 years or more, and wouldn't have passed some 600 colons, which are, which are kind of like the heart of our teaching. Where, uh, we explore uh, one's understanding of emptiness and so forth. So we're in a we are a particularly rigorous branch of sin. And I have never found people uh, questioning my car on this uh, in, in Japan I had to go through I had to study there for uh, six months in a monastery in order to complete my my practice and essentially it was all ritual work that we were doing there. So I had to learn all the rituals, which we don't actually do here, but it was required from the source. Pretty, pretty Can I ask, I mean not to be not to try to pick fights around this issue, but <laughs> but for the other um, you know uh, immigrant Buddhist communities, do you ever see like Skepticism of American convert Buddhists. I mean, is there, are there are there tensions? I mean, I know there are tensions. There was no tensions at this table, but are there other spaces <laughs> where there are the tensions sometimes or conflicts between immigrants and American convert Buddhists? I haven't yeah. seen. I haven't yeah. seen. We also, and we also mentioned before, uh, uh, Sylvie mentioned Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is a monk in the Sri Lankan Theravada tradition and born like a Jewish guy in Brooklyn and sounds a lot like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Bhikkhu Bodhi, from what I know, is really considered one of the leading Theravada teachers, not just in the US, but in, in the world. And he's a you know, 
Jewish kid from Brooklyn. So, uh, so that's certainly an example of a convert Buddhist who is very much you know, part of the global Buddhist conversation. Uh, it's a different, I mean, for me, Jap even Japanese Buddhism, I mean, people in Japan, they just succeeded. So, you know, they don't study, they don't convert anything, they don't understand. So I don't, bring, I don't like that way either. So uh, basically, because I, it's only myself, because some people may be different. You know, people who are not from the Okami tend to criticize the one with the temple system. Mm. The people who are in the temple they didn't criticize the other way. So, so a lot of time. And uh, so, uh, so for me, it's, it's like, for me, I'm half converted actually. Otherwise, I could do this. So, so actually, the one that I respect is the one who really seriously studies and sincerely practice Buddhism, and I respect whoever, I mean, if I want, okay, so it doesn't really matter for me. That whoever really is sincere and that decided to, you know, walk that path, I really respect. But people who are just using the path to, you know, I mean, advertise themselves, you know, just, I mean, those are the ones that I really don't have. So, <laughs> that's all. So, well, there is a quality of, uh, of the American culture uh, of transactionalism and commercialism and capitalism yeah, that, that we haven't talked about that has slides in to Buddhism. There are some frontiers out there. You want to say something? Uh, for me, I embrace it totally because uh, early teaching from my master. He, even in that time, uh, same sex uh, people together, the non misconduct of sexual behavior. He told the people live together. Uh, he said, okay, just keep, don't keep changing girlfriend, boyfriend. You know, these are all the same gay, uh, gay early years. Uh, what I'm saying is that even if some of uh, these students, long term uh, disciples, we can say that the American become a monk, and then after a couple of years, uh, his own disciple, they decided to tell anybody who understands the same language, they say, hey, don't want to be a monk, then you can be free. So uh, some of these students never say even a few years, and years, uh, never say it's a Buddhism. He said, I still keep my Jewish uh, believing. I have a two way. So it's very, very human. You decide just like how. So I could be learn this uh, tradition, then uh, Chen. I also uh, we also practice pure land too, very strong. Chinese Buddhism always the things I have to practice. And I'm bred, I'm bred, I'm raised the uh, Talavada, uh, even the uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I have always friend, I found that the festival, everybody's teaching. Mm -hmm. It's that important, but just a little bit of focus different. So we all have a different personality. Certain kind of fun, <coughs> this kind of practice is very useful for us. So go ahead. Go ahead, just uh, practice it. My teacher, Lazarus Roshi, was a Japanese teacher, uh, came to this country when he was like 23, 24. He came from a, a Zen Buddhist family, very highly placed family. Uh, and uh, he came to be the assistant to the Zen with Bishop in Los Angeles. And he fell in love with Americans. And he said, these are very sincere they, and they really practice and it's not just something they inherited from the world treasure. And so instead of inheriting this temple in Japan, he stayed in Los Angeles for 45 years before he died, uh, really nurturing uh, a lot. I mean, he went to many, many disciples for a really huge part of the uh, Western Zen tradition. And it was that he was just moved by people who were so sincere and wanted to go back to the spiritual teachings. So I think that that's an important moment to be a question. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, could you speak to, have you ever encountered any forms of oppression or obstacles of being a Buddhist, especially like in America, which is not a predominantly Buddhist society? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, uh, I had my ex-boyfriend one day who came out of nowhere, he's like, I'm Buddhist now. So <laughs> maybe people, we're just like so negative about it because I guess they don't understand. Can you speak a little bit more to the 
And especially for those of you who were born and raised in societies that are you know, majority Buddhist and where Buddhism is just kind of part of the fabric of everyday life, you know, what was it like to come to a society where you're a rather small you know, religious minority? Have uh, there been challenges with that? I think there are a lot of challenges, but I think we know it now, actually. Sometimes, for example, let's say when we go to you know, early days when we were walking, people will be laughing at you, teasing you, saying words, you know. When they then, see you in one's row. Right, in our row. So, does it hurt me? Early days it did, but they talk. I thought it's a problem because they haven't seen us. If they have seen us before, they were not doing that. Something that we were questioning them. What are you? They ask us, well, why are you wearing your blanket? That's in a due to ignorance. They do ask them. So is that a point for me to get angry? No, I didn't get angry. So, and it made sometimes to make connection with the people. So then I, if I stop and then talk, oh, I'm happy. They were, after we had the conversation, they become very happy. Oh, thank you for sharing with us. So everything has been a positive thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that maybe uh, very early days, what, due to my ignorance, perhaps I may be either getting upset about it or be uh, intimidated by this kind of behavior, but later on it disappeared. You know, people were uh, due to their ignorance, they did that. But definitely, it was, I think it was appropriate for, I didn't go after this, you know, going to follow those people or getting yelled at them, getting into fights. No, you can't get me. Yeah, I, I have uh, experienced it, uh, not myself, but with some of my Zen students, particularly those who come from strong Christian or Jewish backgrounds, where the family has been upset. Uh, and two particular instances come to mind, uh, where the family is just, you know, very strong, Orthodox Jewish, and suddenly uh, there's someone I'm going to take the precept, which is like taking refuge uh, in the same tradition. And there was a real problem in the family because they felt that he was abandoned. Uh, and also in Christian communities. Uh, if they're very strong and it's, the, it's one of those, my, only my faith, my faith is the only faith, then if someone in the family, usually a young person, <laughs> decides to uh, experiment with follow-up question about that. So if I heard you right, and I might not, um, do Buddhists welcome a dual tradition? And I know that there are plenty of other ones that don't, but so I've heard of Buddhist Christians. Yes. So uh, my, my own family has, has quite a few uh, priests and nuns in our family, Catholic priests and nuns. And <coughs> uh, it comes out of my two years of tradition. And uh, the only difference is, uh, that those priests and nuns are not allowed by the Catholic Church to ordain, but they they have Zen. There's a big Zen family, uh, and uh, I have even participated in a transmission ceremony uh, in a you know, private uh, monks uh, cloister. So. Catholic monks cloister. Yes, Catholic yeah. monks. But but I uh, but so the Buddhists are, Buddhists are open to that. Uh, other traditions are not so open. Uh, one thing I wanted to add to the Japanese community. I mean, since after I came to here, because I see a lot of changes among the Japanese community. Before, you know, especially like World War II time, of course, you know, they're like, uh, considered an alien, I mean, you know, <laughs> enemy, you know, the person of Japan. So that's why the. the the Japanese uh, American community isn't very complicated. <laughs> I, I, I have to say this probably just for because the political situation really affects to that community too. Because it's just a regular Buddhist and then the Japanese Buddhist is especially different. And especially the experience of the concentration camp or so forth is a very 
big difference. And then even about because of that, among those Japanese Americans, there's a difference. Some people who are for Japan, some people who are for US, and, you know, I mean, it just makes a big difference. So, so that's why there are some conflicts that doesn't show up. But it is a conflict, there are still some of the insane, especially when they're dying out too. You know? there, there are many parts of that experience. So even like a, with the young people too, some people, when I was first in 1985, because we don't find any Buddhist book here in the library, I mean, we don't go to find a Buddhist book, so you have to look for a special, special like a bookstore. So then you can find it, so which means nobody knows what the Buddhism is about. Even like uh, when they say Buddhism, they can say, what does you say? Buddhist or Baptist or something? <laughs> 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 so, 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 so which means that like children, you know, they go to the school, they don't have, you know, Buddhist doesn't have citizenship in the school, right? You know, that's why the four day is very important for me in a way. Because all the Asian people, you know, because we have so many four day Jewish, how many Jewish four days do we have? How many Christian four days? By way of context to say yeah. that the Buddhist Council of New York has been working to try to get the Department yeah. of Education to recognize uh, the Buddha's birthday, right? That's not right. Yeah, yeah. as, a, as a day off. And the, the larger kind of political context for this is that the DOE, just for the first time this year, recognized Eid al Adha and Eid al Fitri, the two of the major Muslim holidays, were just recently added to the school closing calendar. And then since then, you know, Hindu New Yorkers have started working to have Diwali added, and Buddhist New Yorkers have started working. <laughs> But it's, <laughs> parents of school-age children are wondering you know, <laughs> when this will ever stop. Well, <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, maybe other revisions can be kind enough to give, them, give up their religious okay. beliefs and give it to the police. I mean, what we can do that, that, that was my question too, but anyway. <laughs> but, so, but then at the same time, you know, you can you know, your revision or your culture is never recognized in the school, even, then that itself is a kind of creative. It's a statement. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, so that's why it's very important to be sort of uh, bringing it to but yet yeah, that makes a big difference for the students who are in the park. So then, once we recognize that, then the Buddhist would be the citizenship of the United States. But so far, for me, it's not. <laughs> one, other, uh, one more question, and uh, I think unfortunately we need to, we need to stop. Uh, so, I have a question about your mode of dress and your shape. So the shape head seems universal. Can you speak to that tradition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but for the third for the months. But the clothing differs, obviously. You all have this style of dress, and I'm, I would assume some of that's uh, dictated by the country and the cultural traditions that you come from. But can you, if Buddhism is an interior practice, then how, then why the physical manifestation of of, of certain way of dressing. I can just speak to that because I, I, I'm not required to shave my head anymore. Uh, women, uh, Zen teachers, are no longer required to shave their head. But you know, I lived a lay life. Uh, I was a professor at NYU for 20 years <coughs> and a lot of other things in my life. And so when I ordained, I wanted to um, I wanted to make it really clear to myself that I was making commitment. Uh, and what I discovered was that people would suddenly come up and talk to me. Uh, and I, I'm very visible. And that, that seemed to be a really nice thing to do with this part of my life, is to be visible, to be of service, just by, the, by virtue of the way I look. Uh, so, and also because I, and not to behave myself, I have to behave myself. That's so striking because that sounds just like we had a fascinating conversation last Friday about uh, um, with our Muslim speakers about failing or not failing. Ah, and that's a large part of what um, one uh, panelist who is hijabi, who wears a veil all the time, said, you know, that for me is important to have the, the the visible presence of my faith, you know, in the sort of larger social world around me. Yes. Uh, so you could put on something or right. remove something. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah. I have been fighting that for long enough. I'm the big activist of uh, 
agenda and product. That's what I was invited to uh, UN, so also some of the uh, meetings specialized because uh, this uh, world has a lot of problems because equality, race, gender, special women and girls, education and poverty and trafficking, so many things that especially in certain religion, the children, girl, they call it girl child, uh, was being forced to do the unspeakable things and that's one of our work to help them out. So myself, uh, when I speak it, Buddhism of the very, very orthodox. There's the Buddhism, you have to have a certain image. But as uh, they say before, four characters, lay people are also equally important than two. So when I speak, of course, a lot of time, I have to behave uh, sitting behind and, you know, not only behind monastic, I have to behind the man. I've been fighting in my temple from the beginning. Our child meditation center, always everybody is uh, sitting together. But unfortunately, when my master passed away, the new generation come in, training in Taiwan. They come here separate everybody. You have to sit here, you have the certain seat reserved for, you know, monastic. That pits me off. <laughs> <laughs> anyone and working hard than anyone, I refuse myself to look like a, uh, like a very sincere Buddhism. I refuse it. I'm crazy, I'm fun, I do whatever I want. But I practice a uh, really big bad, bad ass meditation as we, I was in the rich two weeks ago, Richie said. The new uh, the teacher, meditation teacher said, Oh, I have enough I volunteer. Can you be a uh, like a uh, monitor in the channel? I said, sure. He said, Can you sit five minutes? I said, sure. Can you sit ten minutes? Sure. Okay, did you practice every day? I said, yes. How long? Thirty minutes? I said two hours. You have to sit enough. But that's not my point because people judging each other. Like we don't know who you are. Then first thing, I decided if I want to like you because of your religion, because you are pretty, because you that is not supposed to practice from the world. You have to individual, you have a baby, you have to respect the little babies. Same you of course you have to respect. That's important. Well, that's as good a place as any.